Mr. Clark here, welcome to Remote Learning. Uh, today we're gonna take a look at 18.5, part one, uh, the two sides of the Nixon presidency. You've already gone through some of the focus questions for the first half of 18.5. So as we go through this, uh, your goal is to kind of listen to my lesson, take a look at the responses you put down for the focus questions, make sure you have a similar response. Uh, you need not delete your answer if it's not exactly the same as mine. Just make sure it means something similar. If you need to uh, add to your answer, please do so. So the first half of 18.5 is obviously dealing with Richard Nixon and his presidency. You can see him pictured. Uh, the gesture he's doing there is what Nixon would often do when he was kind of waving to the press as he got on to Marine One, which is the helicopter that takes out, takes the president wherever he needs to go, you know, kind of his signature move there. So today we'll be looking at Nixon's leadership and particularly in foreign policy and uh, how he's going to deal with the communist countries of China and the Soviet Union. Now, when you think about the broader issue of the Cold War, each president that we had during the Cold War era had a different response, policy, or attitude towards uh, communism. As we know, communism and the Cold War really started in the aftermath of World War II, and the president at the time when World War II came to conclusion was President Harry Truman. Truman had two core policies that really became the framework for the Cold War. One was the Truman Doctrine that was initially dealing with Greece and Turkey. Those two countries were attempting to resist the Soviet Union, which, as you recall, had taken control of the Eastern European countries or Soviet bloc countries. And Truman believed it should be the policy of the United States to help out any country that was resisting communism. Then the policy of containment that came from George Kennan, who was a diplomat and had worked a number of years in the Soviet Union. And he came up with the idea and he kind of convinced Truman that we may not be able to free every single country that's communist, but we do want to try and contain communism from spreading to other countries. After Truman left the presidency in January 1953, <clears throat> Dwight Eisenhower became uh, the new president. He was a Republican, unlike Truman, who was a Democrat. He put forth a new policy of brinkmanship. Uh, Eisenhower believed that the United States should be willing to go to the brink of war to kind of deter our adversaries. He also believed in a better bang for the buck, and he was a president who really helped to build up our nuclear arsenal. President Kennedy, he took over in January of 1961. Some of the things that he did in regard to uh, the Cold War, he wanted to make sure we did not have to respond to every challenge with the use of uh, weapons of mass destruction. So we helped to really develop our special forces, Green Berets, Navy SEALs, to be able to have a more flexible response to uh, conflicts that might break out along the around the globe. President Johnson, who is going to be president during a good portion of the Vietnam War, uh, he was the one who would take us to war in Vietnam. And one of the reasons why he believed we needed to go into Vietnam was the domino theory, which he believed that if all of Vietnam turned communist and other neighboring countries, Cambodia, Laos, et cetera, would turn uh, communist as well into Southeast Asia and even maybe moving into eventually into India. The United States, regardless of which president you're looking at, kind of viewed the United States as good with capitalism and democracy taking on totalitarian communist regimes as evil. So when Nixon comes into the presidency, he needs to look for some opportunities to, I guess, uh, put his stamp on what the United States would do in regard to both communism and the Vietnam War. So when you look at Nixon, he uh, promised U U.S. military involvement in Vietnam would eventually come to an end. He promised to turn the fighting over to the South Vietnamese. If we recall from our discussions on the Vietnam War, this included the idea of Vietnamization. Basically, we would aid the South Vietnamese military in hopes of uh, them defeating 
North Vietnam. And as you know how that turned out, not very well. When you look at Nixon, uh, he had a very big decision. Anytime a new president comes into office, you often judge that president based on the company that president keeps and the people he chooses to or she chooses to put into a position of power to help them govern. And for Nixon, one of his biggest decisions was who was going to advise him on foreign policy and national security. And so he chose Henry Kissinger as his national security advisor during his first term. Later on, he would then give him a promotion to the position of secretary of state during his second term. Henry Kissinger, and you can see Nixon and Kissinger pictured here. Nixon on the left, on the right side is Kissinger. Many people consider Kissinger to be one of the most, I guess, astute minds in the history of uh, our country in regard to foreign policy decisions. One of the areas in which uh, Nixon and Kissinger kind of agree was the idea of real politic. It was simply a German word that kind of means kind of practical politics. So Nixon wanted to kind of find a way to thaw the Cold War, kind of lessen some of those tech, uh, tensions between the United States, the Soviet Union, and China. So he believed that he, he should make decisions for the country and even in some, some cases for the world with the best interest of everybody in mind. So the two statesmen, Nixon and Kissinger, argued that if Americans would put aside Cold War biases and the kind of their prejudice in general towards communism and look at the world with fresh eyes, with global interest in mind, maybe not in that same black and white policies that we had looked at in our intro there when we looked at Truman and Eisenhower, uh, Kennedy and Johnson, who all kind of just viewed communism as evil. And kind of keep that in the back of your mind, too, as we move forward throughout the remainder of the school year. Eventually, we get into the 1980s with Ronald Reagan, who's going to be the president as the Cold War comes to an end. He, too, is kind of a black and white, good versus evil type of president. So Nixon is kind of the one president kind of in the middle of the Cold War who kind of took a little different approach. And you can make up your own mind in terms of which approach you feel is best or, or was best. So one of the uh, Cold War assumptions that Nixon and Kissinger questioned, he, they concluded there was not a united worldwide communist movement, meaning they didn't believe that China and the Soviet Union were closely linked together. He kind of viewed and Kissinger viewed each individual communist country as an individual country functioning independently from each other. So just because North Vietnam and North Korea and China and the Soviet Union Cuba or communist doesn't mean they all are sharing the same uh, collective ideas on, on how to proceed forward. So this is in direct contrast to the other administrations that we mentioned. So when you think about China, one of the interesting aspects of China, if you remember the Chinese Civil War was a communist revolution in China. That's when uh, Chiang Kai-shek, he was the leader of, this, uh, of China for a long period of time. He was the nationalist leader. And Mao Zedong led a communist overthrow of Chiang Kai-shek and ousted him from power. And from 1949 forward, China was a communist country. So for the United States, with Mao Zedong's victory, what we did is we basically cut off all relations with China after the 1949 communist revolution. And because Nixon was very passionate about foreign policy, had very little interest in domestic policy, delegating much of his uh, domestic policies to his cabinet members and his you know, vice president, etc. So he wanted to kind of make China one of his centerpieces early on in his presidency. And he believed that even though China was communist, it was very difficult to just simply ignore the most populous country in the world. So from 1949 through the early 1970s, so for over 20 years, the United States did not have any trade with China. And we think about trade today, and the relationship and the dependency we have on China for a lot of our trade, for that 20 year period of time, we really didn't do anything with China. Just like we had a period of time with Cuba where you couldn't travel to Cuba because it was communist after Castro took over, we couldn't travel to China, we couldn't deal with the Chinese and the you know, global economy really lacked a lot of the, the links that it has in contemporary society today.
So if you look at question eight, why did Nixon change positioning against China and choose to recognize it as a country? Economically, he viewed it from a perspective of perhaps opening up a lot of that trade that we see today. In particular, when you look at the West Coast of the United States, the most popular state in the United States today is California. So just you know, logistically going back and forth across the Pacific Ocean would be a you know, natural fit for uh, Chinese and American uh, trade relations. Politically, normalization with China would kind of drive a wedge between China and the Soviet Union. If we could establish at least a cooperative, we don't have to be BFFs and kind of be best friends with the Chinese government. But if we did normalize relations, there was some feeling that this can indirectly have an impact on the Soviet Union, maybe motivating the Soviets to the bargaining table and perhaps towards opening up a, I guess, a stronger bond or relationship between the United States and the Soviet Union. Additionally, we're still fighting the Vietnam War when the Nixon administration takes over. So if a strong relationship could be built with the Chinese, perhaps they could put a little pressure on North Vietnam to potentially negotiate or even uh, withdraw from the war itself. So a lot of this did not happen up uh, happen overnight. So Nixon comes into the presidency in January 19, uh, 1969. It wouldn't be until uh, the winter of 1972 that he would travel to China. He's kind of working on this for uh, a few years to make it come true. So Nixon became the first president of the United States of America to visit the communist Chinese country. He actually walked the Great Wall of China. You can see him there photographed with Mao Zedong, the uh, leader of China. They agreed to normalize relations between the two countries. Trade and travel restrictions were now lifted. Full diplomatic relations would be finally restored during the Carter administration, Jimmy Carter, president in 1979. And the establishment of a working relationship with the Chinese government is seen in history and in retrospect as Nixon's best accomplishment as president. When you look at Nixon's trip to China, it had an impact on relations with the Soviet Union. The Soviet leader at the time, uh, Khrushchev's now deceased. Uh, the new leader of the Soviet Union after the death of Khrushchev was Leonid Brezhnev. Uh, the Soviet leader feared that a close U.S. and Chinese relationship could isolate the Soviet Union and kind of, kind of remove them almost from the collective world community. As a result, after seeing Nixon's relations with China, Brezhnev invited Nixon to visit Moscow, and they were going to hold what is called a summit meeting. The summit meeting is when world leaders come together and it's high level diplomatic meetings, talks, negotiations. It just kind of establishes the idea that maybe they're not such strong adversaries that they cannot talk. So the May 1972 summit meeting between the United States and the Soviet Union had a pretty big impact on the Cold War. Uh, Nixon, in a speech to Congress, said that this was a, an important achievement for the country. He said this uh, recognized the responsibility of the advanced industrial nations to set examples that combating mankind's common en enemies, the United States and the Soviet Union had agreed to move forward and cooperate on major issues that can have a benefit for the planet. You know, once again, they're not going to agree to be allies. They're not going to do joint military operations, but they can work together on things like climate change, reducing pollution and advancing environmental quality. They could work together in a quest to conquer diseases like cancer and heart disease. And a broad agreement was reached in June of 1972 to cooperate in sciences, the environment, and medicine. This too is also a springboard for some negotiations in regard to the arms race. So they would then hold what are called SALT-1 negotiations. It stands for Strategic Arms Limitation Treaty. And this treaty agreed to between the United States and the Soviet Union froze the deployment of intercontinental ballistic missiles and placed limits on anti-ballistic missiles or ABMs. So you can see there are the little visuals there that we kind of looked at there. 
So we look at offensive weapons. It limited it to 5,700 nuclear weapons or warheads each, obviously more than enough to destroy the world multiple times. Limited uh, nuclear subs to 42 each. Somewhat difficult to enforce, but as far as defensive weapons, prevented further de deployment of anti-ballistic missiles. ABMs limited to 200 per country. So they really were working towards a lessening of Cold War tensions. And a fancy word for the lessening of Cold War tensions is called detente. And this opened up lines of communication and cooperation with the United States and our communist adversaries for such a long period of time, China and the Soviet Union. In the short term, this new relationship helped to forge, uh, I guess, a closer bond, helped the United States to eventually end the Vietnam War. In the long term, Nixon's foreign policy breakthroughs moved the world a step closer to the end of the Cold War. Moving on to some issues in regard to domestic policy. Richard Nixon was narrowly defeated in the 1960 presidential election. If you remember, we had looked at the debates and how John F. Kennedy, who looked really presidential, Nixon somewhat sickly looking. And Nixon lost the debate in 1960 to Kennedy and the election by a very narrow margin. So after his loss in 1960, in the presidential election, he ran for the governor of California position in 1962, and he lost that as well. So as a two-time loser, Nixon was very paranoid, very concerned about elections in general. And after winning the presidency in 1968, this kind of paranoia in the back of his head. And it's important to understand this, to understand that Nixon became obsessed with winning re-election in 1972. And that's going to be kind of the cornerstone of our Part two discussion, we go through the second half of the Nixon administration uh, later on this week. We'll be seeing how Nixon, uh, his paranoia is going to lead to him making several mistakes that will lead, in, lead to the Watergate break-in and ultimately the uh, destruction of his presidency. So as a deeply paranoid president, he was always thinking that people were conspiring against him. And that's another core trait of the Nixon presidency that he thought the press, the media, the Democratic Party, you know, even sometimes members of his own Republican Party were collaborating against him. Next, we'll look at OPEC. OPEC, you'll probably see this multiple times. It's actually really a, you know, quite often in the news uh, today in contemporary times. It's the Organization of Petroleum and Exporting Countries. Basically, these are the countries that produce a large percentage of oil for the world. So it's a multinational organization. It sells oil to other countries. And what they do is they kind of serve as almost a monopoly or, or I guess a cartel in some ways where they meet together on a regular basis. And you can see on the map that I have here, these are the different countries that are a part of it. Not every country that produces oil is part of OPEC. It's predominantly uh, the Middle Eastern, African countries, and a couple countries in uh, South America. And so what they do is they want to kind of manipulate the oil prices. So they'll actually agree upon not necessarily the price to charge per barrel of oil. And that's how we kind of monitor oil prices per barrel. They'll determine pr uh, production levels. So if they cut back production, obviously with supply and demand, if the supply is really high of oil, then the price comes down. If the supply is really low, conversely, the oil prices go up. And so for the past, you know, basically 65 years or so, OPEC has functioned in that capacity. In some, in some cases, OPEC has actually used oil as a weapon. So when you look at OPEC, OPEC used this to try and influence a war against Israel. And when you think about the Middle Eastern countries, the Middle Eastern countries generally have a negative I guess, opinion or feelings towards Israel. They kind of feel that Israel took territory from Palestine in the aftermath of World War II, and they always kind of look to get that territory or land back. So in the 1970s and 1973, when a war broke out between Israel and its Arab neighbors, OPEC announced an embargo on oil sales to Israel and any countries who are aligned or allies with Israel. So as a result, that had a, a catastrophic impact on the American and world economy. 
depending on the imports during that period of time, and it's kind of important to understand today we're much more oil uh, independent today. We produce much more oil for our country. We can be completely self-sufficient today opposed to the 1970s. So back then, as we, uh, the country that was dependent upon imports for nearly one third of our energy, Americans soon felt the sting like a bumblebee of this embargo as oil prices skyrocketed 400 percent in a single year. And oil prices have varied quite a bit historically since uh, the 1970s. And one of the activities you had here for question number 20 was to research what the price of a barrel of oil is today. So if you look historically, 1970, $3 a barrel. Now, after all the OPEC and you know, all the different shenanigans with the embargo, by 1980, it was $30 a barrel. So you could see a significant jump in a decade period of time. Then it stabilized a little bit, going up to around $40 a barrel in 2000. 2070, $60 a barrel. Spiked in 2014 to $100 a barrel. And then in 2018, it was $69 a barrel. So if you look at between 2007 and 2018, you can see it kind of varies very often in the $50 to $60 range. And then today in 2020, if you looked up the price, you know, I rounded up to $20 a barrel because it changes every minute when you look at uh, the trading of oil. It's traded on the open market. And you can hopefully figure out why the price is collapsing today. And it's, by, and it's based on that supply demand aspect I mentioned earlier. Supply is high and the demand has collapsed during the pandemic that we're dealing with with the coronavirus. So if you look there just over the past year, so this is kind of just showing you over the past year. So around this time in April, May of 2019, Price was $60 a barrel, and it remained pretty steady in the $50 to $55 range throughout 2019 into 2020, even peaking above $60 a barrel, uh, right, I guess, in late December, early January, as we see, and then it began to go down with some, I guess, forecasting, and we're starting to see the pandemic break out in China and some speculation as to what might happen globally, and then you can then see the absolute collapse of oil prices here into March and April of 2020. So you can see it's down roughly 60% from this point in time a year ago. So that concludes the first half of 18.5. Mr. Clark, till next time, is out.